the verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, Stephen A. Avery, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. His eyes are starting to kind of welling up, and he's looking over towards the jury and shaking his head. And, you know, all I could think of was, you know, what must be going through his mind at that moment, thinking, oh, my God, not again. I, like, I can't believe this is happening to me again. The Netflix documentary series Making a Murderer became a national sensation after it aired last year, and it's been lighting up the internet ever since. It tells the story of Stephen Avery and his nephew, Brendan Dassey, who were tried in 2007 for the murder of Teresa Halbach. But nearly two decades before Avery's trial, he had been wrongfully convicted of another heinous assault. On September 11, 2003, a celebration erupted in Manitowoc County, Wisconsin, as Stephen Avery walked out of the prison where he was locked away for 18 years, decried as a monster. But Avery was suing police and prosecutors for misconduct, giving Manitowoc County 36 million reasons not to forget him. So when 25-year-old photographer Teresa Halbach went missing during the lawsuit, the police may have had a familiar suspect in mind. Avery's attorneys Jerry Buting and Dean Strang won over viewers with their principled and hard-fought defense in the murder trial. They are currently touring internationally, hoping to further the discussion started by the documentary. Reason TV sat down with Jerry Buting to talk about the Avery and Dassey cases, updates since the documentary series aired, and what the cases reveal about the criminal justice system. At the end of the day, do you believe that Stephen Avery is innocent? I do. I do. But what I believe doesn't really matter because I'm just, I'm his lawyer, I'm his advocate. Um, I wasn't there, nobody but God knows at this point. But, uh, you know, I've been at this long enough, when I look at the evidence, I never bought the state's case. It, it, none of it ever made sense to me, and there was certainly reasonable doubt, I thought, that we presented a trial. You know, he had no motive, he was going to get a $400,000 tax-free check from, that was already on the governor's desk, it was, he was going to get within a matter of days, separate and above his $36 million lawsuit. And then when we started digging into the evidence, what little evidence there was that pointed to his guilt looked so suspicious that, you know, it, it just really became very questionable in my mind, not only that, that he was innocent, but that there was some manipulation of the evidence that was going on by somebody. Though much of the film cast doubt on Avery's guilt, at no point do the filmmakers or the defense propose an alternative theory about who killed Teresa Halbach. So why weren't you able to present any other suspects in the trial? Well, there's a rule of law that a lot of states have to sort of limit for defendants just trying to blow smoke and confuse a jury. But it was never required until this case that you also, that the defense also be required to prove the motive of the third party. So basically you have to prove motive if you want to introduce that, but the state, they're allowed to give an alternative theory like Ken Kratz did, right. basically saying that you have to believe if you're the jury, that the police did this, if you're to believe the defense. Are you as the jury, in order to find Mr. Avery not guilty, willing to say that your cops killed her, mutilated her, burned her bones, all to set up and to frame Mr. Avery? You've got to be willing to say that. You've got to make that leap. The thing that's so unfair and imbalanced here is that the prosecutor who has the full burden beyond a reasonable doubt, never has to prove motive. And yet to say that the defense would have to prove the why, it's incongruous in my mind. Also very difficult, particularly this case. From the beginning, their focus of their investigation was only on Stephen Avery, and they, you know, they failed to check out alibis of those other people in her life that were close to her. The kind of investigation that might have revealed a motive, you know, how are we supposed we to know that? that they won't talk to us, They're, you know, and the police didn't investigate. And so in, in terms of those alternative theories, you said you don't want to speculate about that or talk about that outside of a courtroom. Have you been following the speculation on, on Reddit? There's, you know, troves of information. That, I've seen some of it, yes. Over. I mean, there's some, there's some kind of crazy theories on Reddit. There's some not so, not so crazy, some, some pretty interesting theories. Have you seen your theory that you wanted to present in court online somewhere? Some of it, yes but we were stopped by the judge's rulings. In a stunning twist in the case, Stephen Avery's 16-year-old learning disabled nephew, Brendan Dassey, implicated himself in the murder after police pulled him out of school and questioned him for hours without a lawyer or his mother present. His alleged confession seemed to cement the state's case against Stephen Avery, 
and though he almost immediately recanted it, it sent the teenager to prison for life. One thing that I hear from people that watch the documentary, they say, I'm not so sure whether Stephen Avery is guilty or not. I don't think he got a fair trial, though. But when they look at Brendan Dassey, they say, boy, this kid, there's just no, no evidence. We really think he's innocent, and yet he's convicted. And the reason that they think that is because they actually get to see what his interview was like. Here's a guy who's just confessed, apparently, to this horrible, heinous murder and rape, and the total lack of recognition of what he's just said. Do you think I can get there before 129? Um, probably not. Uh, What's at 129? Well, I had a project to 160. Okay. Or, you know, I need to see WrestleMania tonight. I mean, you know, obviously a young man with, with some limitations. So it takes some skill and experience to present a false confession case to a jury so that they understand, because jurors do tend to think people won't confess falsely. We know from exoneration cases they do in as many as 20 to 25 percent of the time where people are exonerated by DNA, they have confessed. And it's even higher for juveniles, right? Isn't it 40 percent yeah, for juvenile offenders? Right, offenders? right. The, the, the younger, the, the more vulnerable the suspect is, the more likely it is that they're going to make false confessions. Mm. But with that, you know, that evidence was presented in court. The jury apparently didn't find it convincing. It was held up on appeal. What does that say if people can watch that and still think that that's okay and that it was not a coerced confession? Well, the jury needs to be able to see the video of the interrogation, but they also have to understand the techniques and the things that are being used. Brendan denied something like 75 times, and yet they don't accept the denial. And you see what can happen when you have somebody who's who's vulnerable and suggestible. I've just denied this thing 50, 70, 70 times. They're not accepting it. I gotta give them something that they wanna hear. And then they start making suggestions about what that might be. All right, I'm just gonna come up and ask you, who shot her in the head? He did. Why didn't you tell us that? So I can not think of it. Now you remember it? And for whatever reason, it still escapes me. In Brendan's case, the very end of it, the, the recording, is about 20 minutes. The defense stipulated with the state the jury would not hear. His mother comes in and, you know, did, did you do this? Huh? Not really. What do you mean, not really? They got to my head. And the jury heard none of that. You know, that might have made a difference for them if they realized that as soon as somebody familiar to him comes into his life again, his mother, he's immediately recanting already. Ultimately, the prosecution elected never to call Dassey as a witness in Avery's trial, and all the charges based on his testimony were dropped. But that didn't stop Brendan Dassey's alleged confession from casting a pall over Stephen Avery's case. One of the things that you mentioned frequently about this case is that it was very difficult to get an impartial jury. There were these press conferences that Ken Kratz held where he went into very graphic detail. During the rape, Teresa is begging for help, begging 16-year-old Brendan to stop, that you can stop this. 16-year-old Brendan, under the instruction of Stephen Avery, cuts Teresa Halbach's throat, but she still doesn't die. There was even a juror from the trial who mentioned that evidence in explaining the reasoning for his verdict when that evidence was never presented in court. So especially now when it's so easy to get that information, you can't just sequester people. What are the implications for jury selection? You know, nowadays with social media, you're right, there is um, even more of it probably. But I think it's really incumbent on the judges to do a better job. And sometimes the attorneys, when they're talking to the prospective juror, the juror will start expressing some concerns. I don't know if I can really be fair about this. And I've heard an awful lot about this. And um, I just don't think I can be fair. I think he's guilty, for instance. And uh, all too often, a, a judge will then step in and say, well, you understand, I'm going to instruct you that you have to put aside any pre preconceived opinions you've got. And right, you understand those are going to be the instructions, yes? And you can follow those instructions, can't you? And a leading question. And, and jurors sometimes feel a little bit intimidated, I think, and almost badgered into saying, yes, I can put that aside when they really can't. 
Stephen Avery's new lawyer for the appeals process, high-profile wrongful conviction specialist Kathleen Zellner, recently gave a Confident Newsweek interview and hasn't been shy on Twitter about criticizing the trial process and claiming she's uncovered new evidence that could free Avery. In addition to new forensic tests, Zellner has cited cell phone tower data that allegedly give him an airtight alibi. Did you and Dean look into the things that she's been mentioning, like the, the cell phone records? We had some records. I don't know how detailed they were compared to what they have now and whether the science have, has gotten better with cell phone records and or cell phone towers and pings and those sorts of things. You know, so I'm not sure exactly what she's referring to, but we'll have to see. The public will have to wait until August 29th, when Zellner is expected to file legal briefs in Avery's appeal. But the intrigue surrounding Teresa Halbach's phone doesn't end there. According to the prosecution, Halbach was last seen on the Avery property, and she made no phone calls after she stopped there. But there was evidence that some of her voicemails were erased after the state says she was already dead, and the police never investigated the lead. Do you have any theory about the situation with the voicemails? Do we know that some were erased, some were not, or who might be? The singular wireless expert said it was not full. With the information they had, people who were calling in trying to leave a message to her would not have gotten the message, the mailbox is full. And yet many of her friends say that they called in and they were getting that message. So somehow or another there were messages deleted, whether intentional or otherwise. The other thing the jury never heard is that there was evidence that somebody at approximately 36 hours before she was even reported missing to the police that somebody had accessed her voicemail. Nobody ever admitted having accessed that. The judge asked the state, the prosecutor, you know, do you know who did that? And they ducked the question. He didn't answer. Does the state know who accessed the voicemail? I, I suppose we could. If there was an inkling that Mr. Uh, Buting was going to suggest that Ms. Halbach was alive at that time, uh, this is something that could have been looked into investigatively. So whether they knew and never turned it over to us, I don't know. According to the state, she'd already been dead for, you know, about 36 hours or two days. How was that being done? Who was accessing her voicemail and why were they erasing something? Somebody who may have had a motive that he doesn't have and somebody who may have had opportunity was doing that. All right, I'm, I guess, having trouble seeing the apparent relevance of it at this stage of the trial. How if that somehow wasn't relevant is still escapes me. Since the documentary series aired, there have been a lot of allegations that it didn't fairly portray the prosecutor's side. On the flip side, is there any evidence that you think was not included that was strongly exculpatory for Stephen Avery? There was. I think that they covered the majority of both sides evidence that was most in dispute. But from the defense standpoint, the bones were pretty important and maybe could have been presented in a little bit more detail. Teresa Halbach's charred bones and teeth were discovered a week after she was reported missing, in the burn pit behind Stephen Avery's garage. Crucially, cremains were also discovered in two other locations nearby, a burn barrel outside a neighbor's house and a quarry pile. If a jury accepted that she was burned elsewhere, then Stephen Avery is innocent and, and they would have had to acquit because nobody would burn a body somewhere off-site, and then bring the remains and dump them in your own backyard, right? Parts of her bones from all over her body were found in the burn barrel, which is behind the Bobby Dassey house. So the one thing that was clear is that one way or the other, they were moved. The site where the body was originally burned would have had more bones that were still connected, or still in the same orientation as in an intact body. If the bones were jumbled up, it would mean that they had been moved to that location. Some of the evidence was lost that might have told us just which was the primary site. Normally, investigators would have treated the burn site like an archaeological dig, mapping out the location of each bone to see if it had been moved. But they did no grid or anything like no that? No grid, no, uh, not even photographs, which is still boggles my mind to think, that, think about. No photographs at all before they started gathering up the evidence with shovels. Everything that was collected in this area was placed together in a box. So why would you burn her in your backyard in the first place? But if you would, why would you then start to move her but only put a few of her bones in a burn barrel and then leave it 100 yards away? We presented evidence that I think was a little more clear than the documentary showed that it was much more likely that her body was burned somewhere else, the burn barrel was used to scoop her up, 
and then dumped in the burn pit on Mr. Avery's property. But a few of them were trapped in the muck and gunk at the bottom of the, that burn barrel, and that's how so those bones stayed. That's how those bones stayed in there. As a defense attorney, is it important to you that you think that your client is innocent, or does it not matter? No, I mean you, the the. The danger is when you start making the assumption yourself um, of guilt or innocence. And I learned something a long time ago back when I was a public defender. We had to open 15 new felonies a month. So you started taking shortcuts and, and triaging basically, you know, is this an easy case? That, you know, is this a hard case? I can't take all of these. I see this complaint and it's, it was a burglary as I recall, open and shut. I started asking, you know, is this true? No, 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 I'm completely innocent. And, you know, and he had this story that was really preposterous, totally preposterous. And I came back from the office that day and was talking to some friends. And, and then there's this guy and this ridiculous story he's got. And um, my later-to-be wife picked it up and said, oh, I'll take that case. And I said, well, go ahead, knock yourself out. She did. She got an investigator. He was telling the absolute truth. He was completely innocent. Case was dismissed. And, you know, I said to myself, you know, what kind of a lawyer am I going to be if I'm, if I'm being the judge and the jury and I'm making that judgment that somebody's innocent or guilty that quickly? Mm. You know, then you end up being like the attorney in this documentary who, before he's even met his client, is telling the police. We have a 16-year-old who, while uh, morally and legally responsible, was heavily influenced. You can't do that. There's one deeply affecting shot from the documentary where right after the verdict is read, you lean into him and whisper in his ear. What do you say to somebody in a situation like that where they've just found out that they're possibly going to prison for the rest of their life? You know, it's very hard. That's, a, that's the tough part of it. I hate, I've only watched that part of the documentary once. Um, that's the most emotional time for, part of it for me as well in that documentary when you see his eyes are starting to kind of welling up and he's looking over towards the jury and shaking his head and you know all I could think of was you know what must be going through his mind at that moment thinking oh my god not again I put my faith in a jury once before I was wrongly convicted I spent 18 years and now I've done it again in this case there was so much reasonable doubt I like, I can't believe this is happening to me again. It must have been so surreal. Um, I know that it was, and, and very difficult for him to deal with, and, and for me and Dean to deal with. Is this the first portrayal of defense attorneys as the good guys rather than the villains, or has it historically been the other way? More often it's, you know, better call Saul or sleazeballs, and maybe unethical, and um, for whatever reason Hollywood thinks that makes better drama or, you know, and so that's kind of the yeah. image that people have had. And, you know, I don't think that what Dean and I were doing is that unusual. I mean, we did our job. It was kind of embarrassing at first when people were saying, you know, heaping all these accolades on us. But, uh, you know, at some point it became, if people want to use us as an example of what criminal defense lawyers are like, really, then fine. We'll carry that, that water for that because it's time that people do get a more balanced view of what a good, honest criminal defense attorney with integrity how they conduct themselves, because that's not that yeah. unusual. And one of the funny things is that you guys have kind of become these sex symbols, right? <laughs> and yeah. how's your family been dealing with that aspect of it? We were in Italy when most of the explosion of interest was happening. And after a few days, it, my daughter like slams sh shut her laptop in disgust. And I can't believe it. I've had enough of this. I'm, and she cut off her Facebook account, shut it, shut it down. And I said, why? She said, because all my friends are talking about sexy Jerry Beauty and how <laughs> sexy my father is and it just grosses me out. So. I mean shutting down Facebook is the nuclear option, right? That's yeah, the it was that right. bad. So, uh, you know, when I think about it, I, I don't blame her. It would be, <laughs> if I was 21, that'd be pretty weird too. If you could pick a top three takeaways from your career, wh what could we focus on that would really improve the criminal justice system on the ground? If Wisconsin had not had mandatory um, recordings of custodial interrogations, the, the public would never have seen what Brendan Dassey's interview was like. And they passed that law the year before, right? Before yes. Before he was interrogated? Um, as part of, or at least during the Avery Commission, the review of things that went wrong in the first case of, for Stephen Avery. 
Ironically, Stephen Avery's arrest comes at the same time Governor Jim Doyle plans to sign a sweeping criminal justice reform bill inspired by Avery's wrongful conviction. A lot of states still don't have that. And in this day and age, there's no reason for that. And it helps the police in some respects, too, because it protects them against claims that defendants may make that they were being abused or promised th a leniency and things like that. So that would be number one. If people want to try and do something on their own, they need to take a more active role in what goes on in their courthouses. People in two big cities, Cleveland and Chicago, just kicked out of office these prosecutors who for years had, had been running on get tough on crime, you know, clanging jail cell doors, and people are saying that's enough. We want people who are smart on crime, not just this lock them up, throw away the key thing. And then if finally, if you do get a, a jury summons, people have to take that and enthusiastically rather than, oh my God, here I am, how do I get out of this? But the reality is that, that that's a civic responsibility. It's the only direct way that people can participate in the third branch of government, the judiciary and apply the presumption of innocence to that defendant just as you would hope any juror would apply to yourself or your loved one if they were sitting in that chair. Mm. And do you think in the current political climate that we're getting closer to getting some real reform? Well, I'm optimistic. I mean, hearing for the first time in my life criminal justice reform talked about by both parties, something is wrong when we're spending more to lock people up than to help educate them. And people, I think, now are starting to push back. People are through cell phone videos are seeing that police citizen encounters aren't always what they were told. You know, there's a lot of racial disparity that's coming to the forefront. So, you know, there's a, a younger generation who is waking up and needs to be invested in taking ownership in their system. People have to say, enough is enough. I'm taking back my system and I want it to be fair. Jerry Buting, thank you so much You're for welcome. talking with me. You're very welcome. For Reason TV, I'm Justin Monticello.